and welcome to Offsing Magazine, the podcast. I'm hosting today. If you don't remember me, what have you been doing the past three years of this podcast? You should be listening. I'm Srinath Ramkumar. And with me today is a host you've heard a lot this last year. It's Pia. Hello, everyone. So, this week is a special one-off episode because this week is, of course... Mental Health Awareness Week. Yeah. So, as you know, every year we've had a special episode for the Mental Health Awareness Week. And this week with us, we have two special guests. Hi, I'm Danielle Pullen. I'm the Human Sciences Section Representative in the PhD Net Steering Group this year. Hi, I'm Alina, and I'm this year's Deputy Spokesperson. Yeah, so... um Welcome, guys. Thank you so much. We actually scheduled this episode super last minute, and I really appreciate you guys being here. So um, one of the main reasons why I wanted to talk to both of you today is because, uh, first of all, Alina, the survey, the PhD net survey, um, for everyone that doesn't know, we have a mental health section where we go into detail about the mental health um, problems that PhD students are experiencing. So we will definitely be talking about that. And then we will also talk to Danielle about power abuse. Um, So why don't we start with Alina? Um, Can you summarize some of the key results from the survey? We can just go through them step by step um, and and see where this conversation leads us to. Yeah, sure. Um, So first of all, maybe it's important to know um, what kind of mental health issues we actually looked at. Um, And so far, our survey actually focuses on depression and anxiety. Um, For depression, we usually look at the last two weeks um, where people have experienced um, these symptoms of depression. And um, for anxiety, we look at two different um, kinds of uh, anxiety, which is state and trade anxiety. State anxiety um, always refers to how you feel right now, exactly in this moment. And trade anxiety um, refers to how you generally feel. Um, And I assume that most people know what depression is, but um, just to give you some background information... So the symptoms for depression would be that you have, in general, uh, lower interest, um, feelings of hopelessness, um, maybe also unhealthy sleeping and eating patterns. Um, Maybe you also experience extreme lethargy or uh, restlessness. So it could always go in both directions. Um, And for anxiety, um, the symptoms could be feelings of tension, worry and insecurity, um, but also maybe that you're losing control, that you have thoughts that we as psychologists would call intrusive. So thoughts that you cannot really control that just come to your mind and just capture you for a longer time. And then also thoughts that you uh, ruminate for a longer time of, so excessive rumination. Yeah. So let's start with some some hardcore data here. Um, Yeah, so actually what we observe um, in general for these symptoms um, is rather problematic. We have seen this in the past years, but actually it seems to get worse over time. Um, So um, to give you some comparison, um, for example, in the general population, we see that roughly 8 to 10 percent experience um, symptoms of at least moderate depression. Now, if we look at doctoral researchers, and this is something that we find in the MPS, but we also see it in other surveys from other organizations, um, we see that um, at least 50% um, of the doctoral researchers report that they are mightily depressed. Wow. And roughly 20% even report symptoms of moderate depression. And when we now take a look at anxiety, we see um, even more concerning numbers, namely more than 60% uh, report at least moderate to high state anxiety and 50% uh, moderate to high general anxiety. Um, I um, I just have a quick question. I don't know if you know this, um, but have those numbers increased over the last years? Is there like a constant increase that we're seeing or has it always been that high? Um, So we do see a slight increase at least. Yeah. Just another follow-up. So is this increase because there are more people actually responding to the survey? Or is it because there are actually an increased amount of depression that is sort of being... Is is it the reporting that's better? Or is it because there's actually an increase because of conditions? I mean, I'm assuming also the pandemic could have been a factor. It could be because I'm assuming a lot of people went through different stages 
from being in isolation? We we thought so as well. But again, so for example, from 2019 to 2020, um, we can see that the numbers are slightly increasing, but we are not able with our survey results to um, explain that this data comes from the COVID crisis. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, but that's really interesting to see that this pattern is there. So I think this is something that people really have to take note and sort of consider seriously when they're making you know, not just policy decisions, but also on a, on a decisions which affect doctoral researchers on a day-to-day basis, right? Yeah, and maybe, um, so as a general policy recommendation, it's also something that we also um, always want to highlight. Um, being depressed or anxious, so having um, psychological impairments um, actually um, yields to earlier unemployment um, and um, early retirement, as we call it, and um, more um, sick leave days. And that's a, a general problem <laughs> in Germany. Um, and yeah, so that's also why all research organizations, universities should be aware um, that higher mental health issues can have long term effects. Yeah, so that's already <laughs> first statistic, super interesting. Um, any anything else? Um, yeah, so um, we actually, of course, we cannot draw any causal inferences from our data. We can only talk about associations. But we do see that there are um, yeah, roughly five big fields that we think should be worked on. Um, these fields concern um, the discrimination people experience, um, the working conditions um, they are facing, their supervision, so this is specifically for the doctoral researchers, their supervision, then the conflicts at work. Um, and um, yeah, so basically we also see that in the end that this can have certain downstream consequences, um, for example, a higher likelihood um, to actually quit your PhD. So this kind of leads us in the direction of... Uh, you know, talking about, you, you mentioned the interaction of the supervisors and stuff like this, because I think these are basic day-to-day -day functions of a doctoral researcher. Like, you, you go through this on a day-to-day -day basis. And certain interactions, uh, such as, you know, like, w where you feel you're being left out of a project that you're doing. And th these, these could be subtle uh, sort of indications of some things. Is there something that you can elaborate on this, or maybe Danielle can sort of elaborate on some of these? Uh... Yeah, so the some of the concerns that we have here, as you say, is that the relationship between a doctoral researcher and their supervisor and their other colleagues is crucial. And it definitely affects their mental health when people are in an, an environment where their colleagues aren't supportive of them or don't understand who they are. Um, and I believe our survey data has this, correct me if I'm wrong, Alina, um, but I think that we also see an association between the microaggressions that some people experience in their institutes and poor mental health outcomes, um, since we're measuring both of those variables. And so I think that's a really key finding in our survey that I would like to highlight. Um, uh, yes, so we see that microaggressions, um, just for anyone who may not have that definition handy. Uh, they're the subtle, indirect, and sometimes unintentional actions or statements of prejudice. So we're not talking about somebody making an overtly racist comment or sexist comment, but just the kind of little things that wear away at you, you know, the expression of like death by a thousand cuts. Um, and in our survey, we see that there are concerningly high numbers of uh, doctoral researchers who experience microaggressions on a regular basis, and that this is affecting their mental health in the long term. Are we doing anything about this? Because I think, you know, microaggressions, it's hard to do something about that. Um, I feel like some people don't even appreciate that microaggression exists. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I don't, I don't know what we would do about it, but I was just wondering whether the Max Planck is doing something about it or whether you guys have any ideas. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult topic. Um, but we try and recommend some best practices at least, uh, and ways that doctoral researchers can stand up for themselves and maybe take care of themselves, um, in lieu of greater social change and the entire world, uh, becoming more sensitive and aware, uh, so I think the biggest recommendation that we've made is setting boundaries. Um, and that can be around when you're working, with whom you are working, in what ways you're communicating with the people that you work with, or what topics you're willing to talk about in the workplace or not. Um, for instance, some microaggressions relate to your ethnic or religious background. And if 
a student were to find themselves frequently being asked to represent their culture in a way. You know, can you tell us about this Muslim holiday that's happening right now? Or you must know about the crisis that's happening politically in some certain part of the world. That's the kind of thing that it would be perfectly acceptable to set a boundary and say, this is not my job and I'm not willing to talk about this in the workplace. Yeah. I'm here to do research and I would appreciate it if we don't have this conversation right now. Um, but we also offer, you know, maybe more specific to working with a supervisor ways uh, to improve that relationship. Um, we'd suggest taking minutes of any meetings that you have with your supervisor so that you, at least for yourself, have a record of anything that might have been said or any expectations that they're expressing of you. Um, we hope that this helps people you know, manage that relationship in a more effective way. Yeah, maybe um, also to that point, um, why is the supervision relationship so important? Um, we actually see, so we, we asked uh, doctor researchers how uh, satisfied they are with their supervision and we um, looked for several qualities and we saw that um, actually the supervision satisfaction significantly related to their mental health issues. Um, and apart from that, um, we also asked um, what Danielle already said about um, the frequency of communication, for example. Um, and here we don't see that there is one advice that fits all. So it's not that your supervisor should communicate with you as often as possible. Um, but it seems that the disparity between what is actually the best for you and what your supervisor asks you to do um, is indicative of your mental health. So... Um, This kind of shows that it's really important to find common ground, to find an agreement on how often you meet with your supervisor and that your needs um, also need to be met here. So if you feel, for example, that you're meeting way too often and that this is stressing you out, then this is definitely something that you should communicate with your supervisor. Um, and something that could really be beneficial here, which we see is also an important um, correlate of mental health, is having structural support. So it shouldn't be only your job to do this communication when you're uh, one and a half years in with your supervisor and you're feeling like this is really taking a toll on you. But the best way to um, improve the supervision quality is actually um, to build a good frame for it. And that should be done ideally by the research organization. So um, what we actually have in mind is having a better onboarding procedure and implementing something which is called a thesis advisory committee, which kind of um, yeah, gives you advice throughout um, the pr process of your um, PhD. And as part of this thesis advisory committee, um, it is important to check whether there is a supervision agreement in place um, actually, before you start your PhD, it should not be done half a year in, one year in, or even later, but it should be done at the start of your PhD. Um, and we actually see that people who report that they do have a supervision agreement, um, and also if they report that they have something like a written project outline, um, they also report better mental health um, than those who do not have this. Um, Yeah, and so in general, such a supervision agreement should cover things like frequency of meetings, which conferences should I attend, what should yeah. the communication in general be like. I just want to add a quick anecdote there because I think as a PhD at the Max Planck Society, when you come in and you, you, know, you join an impress program or not, and you're just part of a department working in some project, so you, you usually either you take over a project for someone else or you're given the freedom to actually start your own project. And sometimes when the supervision is not really there, it, it can feel, you can feel really lost and this can really compound your mental health uh, and, and decline even. So I think this is, this is something that's pretty interesting. I think it's very important that everybody at least has a thesis advisory committee, which is not just your supervisor, but has a couple of additional members as well, right? Who, who are outside of this supervisor and in, interaction with you. Yeah. And um, maybe to that point, so for those who are at this point maybe wondering what is um, a thesis advisory committee or why do I not have one or maybe they think I have one, why do I still need one? Um, we actually saw that um, the thesis advisory committees are not implemented everywhere and also um, the way that they are implemented um, varies um, 
greatly. <laughs> and um, so what we actually plan to do is have guidelines for having these, these advisory committees in the same manner for every doctoral researchers at all institutes. And I think it's important to highlight here that we are very closely collaborating with the general administration, and this is also supported by the leadership of the Max Planck Society. Would all institutes need to agree? Uh, because I, I, I know that like some institutes maybe don't even want the, the TAC uh, system. In the Max Planck Society, we have um, very complicated political um, levels, and um, you need to, it's a longer process to implement such guidelines. And of course, um, you don't only need um, the agreement of, for example, the president or the general administration, but you also need to go through the sections. Um, and um, yeah, so the directors of the institutes also, in the end, need to say that they are willing to implement them. Well, that's good. But I think something important to highlight is there are resources available for the entire Max Planck Society um, that aren't dependent on the individual decisions of an institute or a director or a professor. Um, and chief among them, as I'm sure those of you working in mental health in the Max Planck Society know, is the EMAP program. Uh, that's the Employee Manager uh, Assistance Program. I believe that's what that stands for. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, that's a program that the Max Planck Society's general administration supports uh, that offers free, in anonymous, independent counseling by a third party. Uh, you can call them in English, in German. You can set up a therapy session. I think they actually also offer other languages as well if you prefer a different language. Um, and you can talk about them Talk with them about anything, uh, about your work, about your personal life, about whatever is stressing you out while you're working in the Max Planck Society. And it is a really underutilized but very important resource that is available to all, not only doctoral researchers, but everyone in the Max Planck Society. Um, but I think there's also, you know, there's questions of who is the right person to talk to? Do I need a counselor or a therapist right now? Or do I have a complaint that I need to bring forward if it's a topic of power abuse? And that's a question that we've gotten before when we talk about this topic of, you know, who really is responsible for issues of power abuse? And unfortunately, the answer is kind of it depends. Um, but maybe some general guidance that we can offer here is that if you're talking about a case of microaggressions or discrimination that is overt, you probably want to talk to your equal opportunities officer in your institute. Um, every institute should have somebody filling that role, and they are trained to be helpful on topics like this. And then hopefully coming soon, within the next six months to a year, we will start to have safer spaces agents uh, popping up in our institutes. That's a relatively new program that we've been developing in collaboration with the general administration again, uh, who are also going to be trained to offer peer support in your institutes and to also be familiar with these reporting lines if you think you would like to file some kind of a complaint. Um, for other ty types of uh, people you might want to talk to, though, your IMPRS coordinator, if you're a member of an IMPRS program, and uh, the Equal Opportunities Officer, again, they might be able to advise you about employment issues if this is, you know, an employer-employee relationship that you think is kind of going sour. And for scientific issues, every institute should have an ombudsperson who you could speak with as well. Yeah. I think definitely we're going to put the links to the programs that Daniel mentioned in the description down below. So if you're interested in these, please do click on those links and check them out. Yeah, I was actually really interested in the safer space. Um, can you maybe go into a little bit more detail about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's something that we're very proud of that grew out of the Equal Opportunities Working Group in the PhD Net uh, that they've been working on for the last couple of years now. Uh, that is meant to be a peer support initiative. So coming from the bottom up, um, we have some of these great support structures that the Max Planck Society has put in from the top down. Uh, but sometimes it can just be easier to talk with someone on your own level. Um, you know, we're talking PhD students and postdocs and, you know, people really at every level of the Max Planck Society should be trained in skills like active listening and also in unconscious bias and generally, you know, providing support to each other because the PhD or a postdoc or a career in academia in general can sometimes be difficult. Uh, and so by developing this program, the Safer Spaces Agents Training Program, um, we are offering a certification for anyone who would like to take a few courses and, you know, 
develop these skills further and then become known within their institute as a safe agent who they can talk to. I think that's a great initiative. And I think especially because like when you um, call a, a medical support or for like you there's never the availability you probably expect. Like sometimes people are just not available. Whereas if you do have someone in your institute as a safer space agent, um, that is maybe more available. I think that sometimes when you have these like super stressful situations where you have to talk to someone, that's, it's just, yeah, that's a really good solution. Yeah, we're really excited, uh, and we've been working closely with uh, Frauke Logerman in the Diversity and Inclusion Office of the General Administration, and she's been a huge ally and support for this program, so yeah. we're very grateful for that. Yeah. So back to Alina. Um, let's go to, let's talk about some more results, some more findings in the PhD survey. If you have any. I do have a last, <laughs> last oh. one. Um, yeah, so we have not really talked about the working conditions themselves, right? So right now we have talked about discrimination. We have talked about the supervisory relationship. Um, but we have not talked about what actually the yeah conditions at your workplace should be like um, that do not have necessarily anything to do with your supervisor. Um, and what we see is um, that actually... The working hours per week, um, as well as working on weekends, um, significantly um, relate to mental health issues. Um, so the more you work per week, um, the se more severe mental health issues we observe or symptoms of mental health issues. Um, and for working on weekends, we also see that. Interestingly here... And we see that um, already if you just work um, one weekend um, per month, it suffices to increase your um, anxiety um, for depression. Um, if you um, work uh, three or more times per month, then people, so those people that work three or more times per month, um, report um, higher significantly higher depression levels. And um, this is also not really mm, surprising because we know that um, the mental health indicators actually are relate, um, interrelated. Um, so people who show symptoms of anxiety um, often also report symptoms of depression. And importantly, symptoms of anxiety often precede symptoms of depression. Um, so uh, one could also say that they can be an early warning signal. Um, of course, they are already severe enough, but still, um, if you experience symptoms of anxiety, this is um, really to say you should definitely pay attention to that and um, you should definitely try to find ways um, to mitigate um, those, those symptoms. Um, yeah, and then the last thing, um, but I mean, that's also something that we have been known from the previous surveys is that uh, taking holidays is really important. And what interestingly we find, it's not only the number of holidays that people take, um, but it's also whether you actually feel um, comfortable or whether you have the freedom to take off holidays. Um, so again, um, it's not only about increasing the number of holidays to 30 days, which is which was a really great change, and we are really, really um, happy about that, um, but it's also that now the doctoral researchers need to actually take these holidays. Um, yeah. yeah, and also feel like they are able to take these holidays and allowed to take these holidays, because like you said, in the end, if you just take holiday to put it down on paper that you've taken these 30 days, but you're still constantly thinking about your project, that won't help you relax. And I think that will lead to even more mental health problems. Exactly. Now, the question is, what is the root of that issue, right? Is it the supervisor that is demanding too much? Is it maybe the working culture in general? So it's the same with working um, more hours than expected. If you see that your colleagues are around and that your colleagues never take their holidays, maybe you also feel like, um, as a good scientist, you should just never have any free time. Um, so here, again, yes, you are allowed to take those holidays. And yes, you should not work more than the stipulated time in your contract. And um, you can also be kind of an ambassador here. So set a good example, especially if you are a more experienced doctoral researcher. Um, also do go and talk maybe with younger researchers that have just started their PhD that are very feeling very insecure about what the standards and norms are and tell them that it's completely okay to also pay attention to their mental health. Yeah, uh, just one one more thing to add on that, that we are looking to do even more research to understand this kind of problem. 
Um, so I know in this year's upcoming survey that should be released in the next few weeks for all of the members of PhDNet, we are asking more questions about why people don't feel free to take their holidays and what could be done structurally to better support people actually taking the time they need for their mental health and getting some rest. Yeah. So again, very, very important that people do fill out the survey because as you can see, like we get so much data from the survey, so much important data that then you can actually do something with. And um, so extremely important. Please fill out the survey. And in case you don't receive a link, I think to something really horrible has happened. So make sure to check with your external representative and make sure that you're signed up on the mailing list for the survey so that you get the link for the survey. And if you don't, please contact your external representative so that they can rectify the error. Okay, I think with that, we've come to the end of this uh, rather informative discussion from you know data-based and data-driven analysis as well as some uh, anecdotal evidence as well as a lot of I think there's a lot of stuff going on. And if you're, if you're still th listening to this episode and thinking, okay, what can I do? Please get involved with the Mental Health Collective, with the Equal Opportunities Group as well. And sort of, you know, just try to get involved in things that might basically help to make, you know, your life better, may, may enrich your uh, doctoral uh, career as well. So I hope with that, I would like to thank... I mean, Alina wants to say one last thing. Go ahead. It's um, really just a last uh, call, basically, to everyone who is experiencing even just mild symptoms, um, because there still sometimes is a stigma about about these symptoms. Um, so please just know from our data that this is not an uncommon thing to experience. Um, and it's definitely something that you should if you realize that you are maybe feeling symptoms of anxiety or depression, you should talk to other people. Um, you can first talk to people that you are close to, um, but um, it's also really important that you um, seek help. And that could be via EMAP, which Danielle has already mentioned, but it could also be via professional counseling. So please take it seriously. Seek out and break the stigma. All right. With that, we've come to the end of this episode. I'd like to thank both of you a lot for coming on on such short notice and also being so well prepared. My goodness. Thanks for having me. I've us. never prepared so well for a podcast before in my life. So, <laughs> well, thank you. And I think with that, it's a bye from me. And, and a bye from me as well. Bye bye. Officer Magazine, the podcast is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD and the Science Communication Working Group from the Officer Magazine. The intro outro music composed by Shinat Nakuma and the printer symbols composed by Gustavo Carrizo. If you'd like to give us any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, at Officer Magazine, the podcast or MPPHCNet podcast and write to us at offspring.podcasts at phcnet.mpg.de Until ne next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye.